Good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Must be okay, right at the back. I um, hope you've all had a very good conference so far. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here um, to talk to you all today. Um, and just before I get started, I'd like to thank uh, Joe and Sam for all the hard work they've done so far in organizing a great conference. Um, so, my name is Dave Ward. I am the head of development at Globe Online Limited. Um, we are an e-commerce company, and some of the brands that we own, you may have heard of. If you're into home and garden furniture, world stores. If you're a parent, uh, you might have bought goods from Kitty Care. Um, and if you're into getting some really good deals on luxury furniture, uh, Ashika, you might have heard of as well. And we're now part of the Dunelm family, um, who also sell home and garden furniture, but have much, a much more bricks and mortar presence than us. We're, we've typically been purely uh, e-commerce online. And we're really proud of the fact that a lot of our, um, well, in, in fact, our entire delivery pipeline is, uh, the tech for that is developed, um, it's maintained and actively developed completely uh, in-house, and all of, our, um, all of our products are proprietary solutions. Um, so over the past four or five years, we've really grown up a lot as a company. About four or five years ago, we, very mu we, had, we had a very much of a startup vibe to us. Um, there weren't you know, huge amounts of good practices, um, but it's been fantastic to be part of the journey. And we've kind of, we've, we've really evolved over that time. Um, uh, some of the things that I've really enjoyed doing is actually uh, implementing change. And we've been really lucky uh, that we've been allowed to do this. There are you know, some companies out there where they're not particularly agile. It takes a really long time to actually see any positive benefits um, from change. Uh, some of the things we've done to improve efficiency, you know, whether it's small things like um, introducing composer dependencies, which was something we did four or five years ago, we didn't have that. that. Whether it's uh, something which the company needs to buy in a bit more, like changing our um, methodology from what's very, what was very waterfall to now a really nice agile um, agile way of working. Um, two, of the, two of the problems that we've typically had and took a bit longer to solve um, were in the area of development environments. So I remember when I first joined um, as a developer, uh, the development environment took me about a week to get set up. And you guys may or may not have experiences with that. Um, uh, but we were using a custom compiled version of PHP. Um, it, it was a complete nightmare. And then when we did actually manage to get it set up and running, it looked nothing like what we were running on production. Um, uh, I had no guarantee that the services that I'd set up were the same versions. We had a lot of problems with uh, developing code um, and actually getting it out into the production environments um, and then suddenly coming across you know, a random, completely random bug, which you couldn't replicate on your local environment, um, and you had no anticipation of. So that was one of the, the uh, big problems that we had. Um, the other main problem um, was to do with the management of those production environments. We've got a great team of developers in WorldSource, um, uh, some of whom are here right now. Some have elected not to come and listen to me. Um, what we've really kind of lacked is um, that same kind of resource on the system admin side of things. So uh, we've had a few attempts at producing well-managed production environments, some with Chef, some with Puppet. And whilst they all start out pretty well, um, uh, we, we, whichever implementation we went for, um, because of the lack of resource, we usually hit points at which 
um, we'd kind of throw away all of the, the rule sets that we developed for those, and we'd end up building exceptions into processes, and so sooner or later, um, our servers were all ru running their own different uh, versions of Puppet and different scripts, and uh, we pretty much had to take it off all of our servers, stop it running, and we, we kept going back to square one. So, these were a couple of the problems that Docker solved for us. Um, so I'm not going to go through my mind dump of Docker benefits, which we've ha uh, which we've seen, um, but some of the the really um, beneficial parts are the dev environments. So as I was talking earlier, the dev environments are now pretty trivial to set up. It's a case of three commands, um, and actually we know that when a developer is actually developing its code, they have the exact same versions of those services um, running on their local machine as the ones that we're running in production. With the same setup for uh, all of our different projects, um, it actually, for me, uh, makes my life a lot e easier as well. So because the setup is the same, um, we can actually move developers to different projects uh, very, very easily now. So one of the things we've done, we've changed from a huge monolithic application running our e-commerce platform itself, and we've started breaking that up into microservices. Um, and with the identical setup, um, all of these little microservice teams, they can be ramped up and ramped down really, really quickly. Developers don't uh, don't take any time at all to, to onboard on those projects. Um, so test sites as well. So actually, all of the environments that we have, um, those environments are now completely identical to what they're developing on, which is great. As a result, um, our releases into production have gone from this to clicking a button and walking away and having a coffee. Um, so that's been really great to see. Rollbacks. We haven't actually had to do any rollbacks yet. Um, we've now been using Docker in production for just over a year. Um, we were using it in development before that. Um, but actually, of the eight different services, applications that we have running in Docker in production. We haven't had to do any rollbacks, but if we had, um, because we're actually creating immutable images, uh, those rollbacks are really, really stable if they were to happen. Uh, scaling is very easy, um, uh, and actually, yeah, right, down, right down to the end, um, it just improves the efficiency um, in a number of different areas for us across the board. <clears throat> so, why this talk? Um, over the past three years, I've been attending many conferences where um, there have been Docker, Docker talks. Most of them have been introductions to Docker, and pretty much in every single one of them, the speaker stands up here, and he asks the same three questions. So the first question being, uh, who here has heard of Docker? I'm not going to ask you these questions. Uh, who here has heard of Docker? And at that point, kind of 95% of people stick their hands up. Who uses Docker in development? Uh, at which point, maybe about 50% of the room keep their hands up. And finally, the last question, who uses Docker in production? And over the three years, I've seen the number of hands um, actually increase for the people who use Docker in development. Um, but for some reason, people are still not using it in production. Um, so this was a leap which we took, and th there's not really a lot to it. So uh, this talk is going to try and give you um, a, a good picture of what it takes to run Docker in, in production and to give everyone the confidence to, to do that as well. So an interesting uh, 
um, stat I came across. It's a little bit old. It's about six months old. Um, but Docker adoption, this is in production, is actually up uh, quite a lot. So 30% growth in the year ending May 2016. Um, what is interesting about this is that actually the stats here, um, well, it shows big increase, but that increase is largely driven by the large companies. So Datadog have, um, they found that uh, the more hosts you have with them, the more likely you are to uh, start playing around with Docker, and the more likely you are to get it out into production. Um, so actually, it's not the big companies that I'm interested in. I'm more interested in getting the smaller teams, uh, smaller companies, in translating their projects over to Docker and deploying those in production. So, what is Docker? Uh, I am assuming that most of you um, all know what Docker is. I'm not going to go into it. Um, just a little uh, straw poll. Uh, everyone who doesn't know what Docker is, stand up. Great. So everyone should know then all about Docker files, about the differences between images and containers, possibly be familiar with um, the native orchestration of Docker, which is Docker Compose, Docker Machine, um, all of those kind of core, uh, core things about Docker. So I won't go into that. Um, if you want to find out more about that, there are loads of tutorials, loads of YouTube videos online. Um, I would recommend this blog from a friend of mine. Um, Mike, he's produced a great blog on actually um, dockerizing kind of your first PHP application, um, actually using PHP FPM and Nginx, um, and get something up and running really quickly. And he's also recently updated that to make use of Docker Compose v2. <clears throat> so if you were to look at that blog, um, you would end up in a position whereby uh, you have what I call a development Docker image. So usually, these Docker images are based from trusted images, and that's important. Trusted images are great to use. They are, uh, you know, you, you can actually trust them. They haven't got any nasty, malicious code in them. Um, uh, they are constantly fixed with the latest security patches. So that's great. Um, uh, <coughs> often, you'll mount your code into that image. Um, you may then use the docker commit co command to actually create a snapshot of that image in time, uh, of that container to an image. Um, you might then, with that image, push it to an image repository. Um, you're not really going to have thought about your configuration for it. Um, and yeah, kind of you might not even be using Docker Compose for that either. You might just set it up manually with a series of Docker run commands. So what we generally see when we're using Docker for development purposes is we'll have our project, which will exist in a Git repository. And we will pull that project. And that, I'll, I'll show an example of this later. Um, but we'll pr pull that project down. And within that, there will be a Compose file. Um, which we will then run a Docker Compose up. That may then um, get more images from Cloud Registry, or it might choose to build an image from a set of Docker file instructions. Um, you'll end up with a set of images. We'll run those. And then we will mount our PHP code into the container so that we can actively develop on it. We can iterate between development. Um, if we have any dependencies once the container is started, um, we will um, actually run our composer install or our bower install or whatever dependency you might be using. And environment variables and um, any secrets you might have, so API keys, that kind of stuff, 
um, you'll probably just start t tinkering around with them inside the actual container. Um, so, these images, they're really good to get up and running. They allow developers um, to start working from the same page, so they all have the same consistent environment. Um, doesn't matter what kind of platform they, they're on, whether they're using um, you know, Linux, Mac, Windows, although Windows is a bit harder to get set up on. Um, but they can all end up with the same environment. Um, and because we've mounted our code in, we can actually use our IDE for development on these. The problem with them is they are just not suitable for deploying into production. With the code, you might have ended uh, committing those um, and pushing your image to a Docker repository, um, Docker Hub, or private repository of your choice. But actually, when you see that image, there's no traceability of what's gone into it. You don't really have any idea what anyone's done to, um, to create that image. So there's no transparency there. Um, often they're environment specific, and to get them maybe running on a production site, you might have hard-coded the uh, config variables into a file and committed that to another image layer, which you've then pushed up and deployed that to production. But now that, that image, it's only specific for your production release. You can't deploy that same image to a staging environment or a testing environment. Um, uh, essentially, the images, they're not immutable. So, what do we want from our production images? We want them to be immutable, and we want them to be ephemeral. Now, these are kind of two fancy pants words for things that are actually um, quite easy to understand. So, by mutable, we mean that they are unchanging over time. So, for our Docker images, we want uh, to be able to you know, ramp up servers, ramp up nodes, actually scale the number of services that we have um, at any point in time. And we want the behavior of our image to be the same every time we do that. The difference between kind of what we had before Docker um, and what we've got with Docker is that, so, so we were using um, a deployment tool called Rocketeer before that, um, which is based on Capistrano. And before that, we were using kind of um, Git pools on our production servers. And before that, we were using file transfer protocol. Um, that was a long time ago. Um, so with all of those methods, what you're doing on each of your environments is you're getting uh, your deployment tool to do a git pull, to do a composer install, to actually um, go through all the instructions you've given it, and you're hoping that the code that you get out of it is the same as what you've got on your QA site and what you've got on your staging site. Um, and largely, you know, that works pretty well. But the great thing about the Docker images is that the actual image you've got has got the exact, it's got the identical um, files that you're deploying on each environment. So I was, I was thinking about an analogy for this. Um, my mum makes great cookies, really good chocolate chip cookies. And it's almost the same as um, her giving me the recipe for those cookies um, and me following those, that, those, those set of instructions step by step. But I'm actually using you know, very slightly different ingredients. It's not the exact same sugar that she's been using to create her cookies. And even though I might be as good a, uh, well, I'm a terrible cook, actually, <laughs> especially for desserts. Um, but 
even if I am yeah, as good as her technically, um, I won't end up with the exact same cookie as the ones that she's kind of baked for me. I don't know if that's a rubbish analogy or not. Um, uh, so moving on to ephemeral. So for Docker, we want to make we want to make sure that all of our images um, are prepared to be short-lived. So what this means is that the Docker images, the containers that we create from them, um, we've got to expect those to go down at any time. So we need to make sure that they're stateless. If they contain any kind of state, then uh, when those uh, containers are destroyed, we're going to lose that. Um, so these are two things that we want from our production images, and um, I'm going to show you how to do that, hopefully. So for production-ready artifacts, um, here are some of the things that we need to do with them. Uh, I strongly recommend automated builds, which I'll talk about. We've got to take care of our application code. Um, we have to take care of the dependencies, um, and we have to make them environment capable. So what we'll end up with is something like this. Um, we'll have our uh, Git repository with our project. Um, from that, when we trigger an automated build, uh, that automated build will go and um, create an image which has got the PHP code. It's also got the dependencies installed into it. Um, and we'll be taking care of uh, our environment variables as well. That image will get built on your Docker registry, and you'll end up with an image there. Um, and then when we run it in production, we just run an instance of that image, and we pass in um, our environment and, and our secrets at runtime. <clears throat> so before we get started on that, um, I'd just like to posit a proposed repository, repository structure to everyone. There's, there's no real kind of set way of doing this, but this is um, how I've found to be the clearest um, and easiest way of structuring your repository. Um, so kind of before, well, usually your repositories consist of your application code. Um, at the root level, and now you should be thinking that your repository is one level up. So actually, your entire project environment, all of the services, all of that is now under version control. So within the app code, I think it's great that that now just contains everything that you used to have at your root level. It doesn't actually contain any Docker files at all. Um, and you know, if someone is adverse to using Docker, they could just take the contents of the app code and fire it up in whatever environment uh, they wanted. That's never actually happened. Um, but it also gives developers a really, clear, um, a really clear place of where their development should largely be. And when they're submitting pull requests for code review, um, you know, it's very easy to see that you know, if, if they're um, making changes to other, other files there, um, they've got to have a pretty good reason for doing that. So it really helps with clarity. Uh, the app data directory, that holds a Docker file, um, which ends up creating a data-only container of the app code. And that data-only container, um, you know, if you're using PHP, FBM, and Nginx, you might just be using Apache. But that then shares um, the application code to your Nginx and PHP, FBM servers. Um, we have our dockerfile.build, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But essentially, that's the Docker file that we're going to use to build our production image. Um, uh, the reason why it's sitting out of, um, out of any of the directories is it needs context to uh, the app code as well as PHP FPM. If it was, if it was stuck inside one of those, um, when the automated build took place, it wouldn't really have visibility of anything outside of the directory that it's in. Um, we also have the Docker Compose standard YAML file um, and the override YAML file. So when you type in Docker Compose up-d, those are the two files which will be used 
um, to start up your containers. Um, and then we also have a, a, a prod site YAML. And that is there to simulate what we do on production. So depending on where you deploy um, your Dockerized application, they might have slightly different ways of orchestrating. You might be using Docker Data Center, and you might be using Docker Swarm. Um, you might be using Kubernetes. You might be using Mesos. You might be using AWS. So um, for example, with AWS, which is uh, who we use, um, they use, uh, they have the concept of task definitions, which provides the orchestration. So if we ever just want to check um, that, uh, to, to check what has happened on production, we use this prototype YAML to fire up um, a kind of quasi-production simulation. So the other great thing that uh, this repository structure gives you um, is the ability to get up and running in just three commands. And you've probably all seen this before, um, but this is literally it for developers to get up and running. They should only have to type in three commands into their console. Um, so we've got the git clone, we've got the change directory to the app, and then we've got the Docker Compose app. So it's really, really quick, really simple, um, and the same for every project. So just talking about automated builds uh, for a second. Um, these, for us, they build our deployment artifacts. Uh, we can set them on automatic or manual triggers. So whenever, um, whenever we make a push to our master branch or develop branch, that actually automatically builds um, tagged images under latest and stable for master. Also, whenever we um, tag an image with a semver number, that also triggers a new build, and it tags the image appropriately. Um, they're great for kind of, if, if you have any errors in your, uh, in your builds, they'll tell you about that. Um, the important thing about these are that they give you the transparency behind that Docker image that I was talking about that was lacking from development images. So because they're completely automated, um, you can completely, uh, you can understand what's gone into that image completely. Um, there's, you know, there's no other way of injecting sneaky bits of code or anything like that. So you, you know, you've got a complete blueprint for what's gone into that image. Um, some other cool things, uh, repository links. So if you have one image which is based on another, then actually, if one image gets a push to it, it can trigger uh, an automated build in a different repository. Um, and we use uh, the webhooks aspect of this as well to send us notifications um, to our Slack channel. So if something goes wrong with an image, um, we have a shim running. Uh, and the automated build, um, if something goes wrong, or if the build succeeded, it'll send a quick message um, up to the shim, and that will then notify Slack for us. So that's really cool. Um, so this is an example of an automated build. Um, so this is how we set up most of our images. Um, and actually, when a build is triggered, really you can replicate it in two or three commands. I've stuck in an extra couple of commands there to show what's happening on the develop tag. Um, so if I were to do a push on the develop branch on this project, because that trigger is set up, um, we'll do a git, it'll do, essentially it'll do a git clone of um, my repository from git. It'll change directory to that. Um, because it's develop, it's going to build the latest uh, tag. So it'll check that out, build the image, and then push that um, to my repository, my Docker repository. So that's kind of a simulation of it. That's what's happening. Um, so yeah, advantages. Talked about uh, the transparency that it gives you, um, and you know the great thing about it as well is that the image repository is kept up to date completely with any code changes uh, that are pushed. <clears throat> so application code. We've seen 
Um, in development, what kind of happens is we check out the repository, um, we start the container, and when we start the container, we mount the code into it. There, there are a couple of other ways of doing this as well. I've seen some people um, who have started the container, they've got their code copied into their container, um, and every time, every time they want to develop and see something, um, then they have to restart the container, and that kind of reloads the code um, into it. For us, um, we like using IDEs, as I'm sure most of you do, for development. Um, so by mounting the code in, that still allows us to use our IDEs with Docker in development, um, and still allows us to see all of the changes kind of in real time. Uh, so in production, as we've seen, uh, what we're going to end up doing is when that image is built now instead, we're going to copy the code in. So that's pretty simple. <clears throat> so I'm just going to show a quick demo of this. Um, OK, so I've got a very, very simple application. It's going to be you know, your kind of standard hello world. It's not going to have any dependencies yet. Um, I'm going to clone that um, from my Git repository. I'm going to change directory to it. And I'm going to uh, check out an earlier tagged version of it. Um, so if we have a quick look at what's in here. I need to make that bigger. OK, hopefully you guys can see this. So in the app code, really, really simple. We've got an index.php file. Um, we've got our application data. So this is going to create our data in a container um, with, uh, with that index.php file. Um, we've got our Nginx container. So this is kind of a basic setup of Nginx. Um, and we've got a really, really simple PHP FBM file, which is from the trusted PHP image. Um, so when we do a Docker Compose up, um, we're going to see our development workflow. So. So that'll take the instructions. We'll fire up our application. We can see that it's running on port 8080. So if we now go to um, port 8080 here, we've got hello PHP UK. And if we go back to that, and if we actually make some changes, um, yeah, we can see that it reflects in real time. So that's great for development. Um, in production, what's going to happen? Um, so the original PHP Docker file is all it's doing. It's getting the PHP um, image, and it's setting London to be the local time zone there. Really, really simple. Um, all we're doing, very simply, is just for our dockerfile.build, our production image, we're copying the app code um, into, into that. Um, and I've got this running on an AWS um, cluster. So I think this is, yep, this is running um, that very first image. And you can kind of see here if we get the right URL for that. You can see this, because this has got the code in, um, it's, it's running up there. It doesn't have any of those changes that I've just made to it, of course. Um, and that code is now set in stone within that image tag. It's never going to change. Um, the great thing about Docker as well, with you know, the, the ability to HA it very easily, um, is that it makes it pretty much impossible for developers to go onto production systems and tinker around with code, kind of as if they were doing on production sites, which is a really bad practice. Um, so this, you know, this method actually makes it pretty, pretty much impossible for them to do that. Um, OK. So that's the application code. Copy it into the image, um, get that image built. That's now part of the way there. <clears throat> so the next thing we need to uh, do is sort out dependencies. So 
a lot of the time we use Composer to get third-party libraries in. We use Bower as well. Um, uh, you might want to compile um, CSS using SAS, something like that. Um, so typically, uh, when we um, use this in development, we clone, uh, we clone our repository, and after we run the container, we then install the dependencies. So because we're mounting our um, actual PHP code in afterwards so that we can use our IDE as well, um, if we were to do this as part of the image build, we'd actually overwrite the vendor directory at that point, um, and we'd kind of lose all our dependencies if we did it at an earlier time. Um, so here are some of the ways we uh, might uh, install the um, dependencies post-container run. We might use the official Composer uh, installation image. Um, for that, I wouldn't recommend it because um, that image itself doesn't have uh, the platform requirements that your PHP FPM container might have. Um, so generally, you have to run that with uh, the ignore platform rex flag on. Um, another way of doing it is actually installing Composer as part of your PHP FPM um, base image, and then using that um, to execute the Composer installation. At that point, if you do have any um, platform requirements that are missed, um, yeah, that'll kind of stop your install there, and it'll alert you at that point. Um, both of those are manual ways of doing it. So for us, we um, put this as uh, an en entry point script. So I'll show you what we do there. Um, in production, it's kind of, it, it is a lot easier. Um, we copy our application code into the container, and then we run the Composer install as part of the image build. So that all goes into the container um, in production. OK. So showing this off. Um, OK, so um, some of you might have been to Louis Strabici's talk about um, JWTs earlier, just one talk before. So this is using his library to create a JWT. Um, you can see here that we don't have um, a vendor directory at present. Um, but what we do have, uh, so you can see now that we're installing Git and Compose now as part of the image. And instead of just allowing PHP FPM to do its thing, which is um, to start up its PHP FPM process, we're going to get it to execute an entry point script. Um, and that entry point script is going to do something really simple for us. It's going to take care of installing Composer. And uh, it will then start the PHP FPM process. So the great thing about this, again, is that it's still just those three commands um, that we use to get the environment started. Um, so if I kill everything and start everything up again, what we'll see, <clears throat> if I take a look at the logs of the PHP FPM container, uh, you can see it's cloning the appropriate third-party library that we had in our composer lock file. Um, and it's installing that in. Uh, that's having mounted the application code in. So actually, we can see the vendor directory is there now. And if we have a look at um, our development site, we can see we've got a JWT there. Um, again, when, um, when, if I look at, um, when you actually create that, uh, so here at this point, 110, um, when that's actually pushed to Docker Hub, that then creates our automated build. And so you can see we've got our 110 tag there, our 100 tag. So the 100 had the, um, 
had the Hello PHP UK, and this, this builds now got our third party library. Um, so if we deploy that, um, we go to the service, deploy our new image, and we should see that once, that, um, once that's deployed, uh, we've now got a single image which has got all the dependencies installed into it. Um, and that's, yeah, it's now a great immutable image. Um, I'll come back to that because it might. Let's see. So we've got a pending task now. Um, this one will fire up when everything's OK. It'll stop the previous task. Um, and we'll be able to see on our production environment um, the new JWT. OK. So one of the things that um, one of the slight stumbling blocks we've had, we use Satis to um, keep our own proprietary dependencies private. Um, and obviously, for those, you need to kind of have your SSH keys available to download and install them. There are a bunch of strategies that we've tried for this. Um, so what we've settled on is having a company-wide base image for WorldSource PHP FPM. Within that, we can put our deployment keys for our private images. We can rotate those deploy deployment keys um, whenever we feel we need to. And whenever we have an application, that will use the base image. So by doing that, um, the developers who have got their Bitbucket accounts and their Docker Hub accounts with those two things, they can actually um, use our private dependencies and have that still installed all automatically with those three commands. So I've just talked a bit about the base image. Um, if you haven't tried using a base image, uh, even if it's just a really simple one to begin with, I would really recommend it. Um, some of the benefits you'll get from that are making service upgrades really trivial across all of your applications. So for us, we have um, eight applications, eight microservices now running in production. Uh, they are using our base image. That base image uses PHP 7.0 at the moment. But we've also uh, recently upgraded to PHP 7.1. So all you have to do at that point is upgrade your base image to PHP 7.1, create a new tagged version of that. And then when all the applications are ready to upgrade, um, you can just uh, upgrade their Semver uh, image number, which is really nice and easy. Um, other things we have in the base image, uh, I mentioned we have deployment keys. We also install um, you know, things that all of our applications will need. So Composer, for example, is installed into that base image. Um, uh, <clears throat> the final thing to really get right um, is your configuration and your secrets. So this is something that you know, people tend to leave to last, I find, really. Um, it's really important to be able to create an image that you're going to use on your staging environment and your production environment and possibly test environments. It's really important um, to have your configuration completely sorted so that that image can be the same image that's used for all of those. Um, some solutions here. Uh, so the first one is the most simple one, which I'd really advocate advocate against not doing. Um, so that's where you literally bake it into the image. And what you're going to end up with there is an image which is just specific for your one environment. Um, so the way that most people do this right now is to use environment variables. This is part of the 12-factor app, which um, provides you know, really good best practices for modern day applications. Um, and by holding, um, by holding your configuration parameters there, um, you can change those depending on which, in, which environment um, you're actually starting up. Um, other ways of doing this, um, 
So you can actually use volume mounts, and you could create a file uh, which has got all of your configuration, and your secrets parameters in it, and then you can mount that into your containers when you run them. Um, you could use a, a secret store, so you can actually use the third-party provider, um, which will then submit an API request to actually retrieve your secrets for you. Um, some of the reasons why people don't like the environment variables um, is that, and actually some of these other solutions, um, is that it's not secure enough for them. For example, with environment variables, um, those are actually exposed to the entire container. Um, so for you might, uh, something might go wrong and uh, you might end up, end up logging your entire environment, uh, your entire environment, which will then expose all of your secrets in your logs, which you don't want to do. Um, those environment variables are also visible to other containers that are linked to the container that you're running. Um, some of the other methods, well, the other method that I put up there is orchestration-specific solutions. So Mesos and Kubernetes, they've got their own solution. Um, but by hopping onto that, you're kind of, and it's possibly not a bad thing, but you're kind of locking yourself into that to that orchestration tool. Um, for us, we use environment variables. Uh, this is the MySQL trusted image. Um, at the moment, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us too. Um, however, that is going to change soon. Um, so this is an example of uh, one of our Symfony applications. Um, so uh, this is our parameters YAML file, and when we run this image, um, we actually pass in the database host, the database name. I've got a screenshot of that. Um, so on the left, we've got development. So you can see with MySQL, we're actually building that image um, from scratch. Um, we are setting uh, some very simplistic um, passwords for local use, and those local uh, local variables get set in environment variables for the PHP FPM image. Um, I remembered to blank out the passwords um, earlier this morning, uh, but this is uh, our task definition for production. So you can see here we've got a bunch of uh, environment variables which are used. Um, we've got our database host, database name, uh, so we can. All we have to do is slightly alter that environment setup, um, whether it's on staging, whether it's on production, um, and we can use the exact same image uh, on both environments. Um, something which is worth talking about, uh, which I haven't had a chance to use yet, um, is Docker Secrets. So this is something that's uh, recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, been announced. It's part of Docker 1.13. Um, at the moment, it's only available um, to Swarm services. But the idea is that we're going to be able to use this for all of our secrets management going forwards. So uh, things like usernames, passwords, SSH keys, um, anything you want, uh, you're going to be able to use the Docker secrets service. From what I can tell, because I've not actually used it yet, um, it's going to work a little bit like this. Um, you will set your secret um, by uh, echoing it into the docker secret command. Um, so here we've created a DB password, and then we're going to grant a service access to that secret. Um, and by doing that, so when we specify the dash dash secrets, DB password, um, it's going to take the decrypted secret from the Swarm Manager, um, from the raft log there, and uh, it's going to mount it um, onto an in-file, uh, in-memory file um, running on the container. Um, so that file is, will be under forward slash run forward slash forward slash secrets, um, and MySQL are actually already changing their image to support this, um, uh, 
But what that'll mean is, uh, instead of actually specifying your um, secret as part of the environment variable, you can just specify the path to that environment variable. And then the application will take that path, read the secret from the in-memory file, um, and away you go. Um, so there's all kinds of information about this available at um, docs.docker, that link at the bottom there. If you want to start preparing your images for that, um, all you need to do is make sure that for any of your parameters or secrets that you want to use this, you just need to make sure that they can read um, values from a file instead of just having it um, straight up. <clears throat> so I'm going to quickly, um, I know it's, it's nearly lunchtime, uh, going to quickly talk about um, a few more things that should be considered um, when deploying to production. So logging is really important. As we all know, it gives us um, an insight into what our application is doing. Um, and logging in Docker is not an entirely simple thing. Um, uh, there doesn't seem to be one strategy for absolutely every situation at the moment. Um, because containers are ephemeral, uh, by their nature, they will be shut down, they will be fired up at any given time. You shouldn't really be thinking you know, about persisting that container for eternity. Um, uh, and so if you're logging straight into the container, um, you're actually creating state in that container, and that state you're going to lose. So you want to be thinking about centralizing your logging, and I'll quickly outline a few ways of doing that. So the easiest way, um, if you want a little bit of persistence, is to um, store your logs in a data volume. That then means those logs are kept on the host, um, and you can back up your logs uh, really easily from there. Um, for us, we don't use that. Uh, it's not great for an elastic architecture where the hosts are scaling up and scaling down the whole time as well. Um, but on non-production systems uh, where you need um, logs that last a bit longer, it's a pretty easy solution uh, to get started with. Um, uh, the Docker logging driver is something that's native uh, to Docker itself. Um, if you've ever tried doing Docker logs, uh, you've got the default driver, which is the JSON file driver. Um, and that, uh, that actually reads the standard output and the standard error generated by the containers there. So um, it's really easy to configure. There are lots of different log drivers um, that you can use. Um, there's there's one for AWS, which is great. There are, there are ones for Splunk, for many, many other logging applications. Um, so the great thing about this is it is quick and easy as well. Um, and if you haven't set up your uh, application with custom logs, then this would completely suffice, this solution. Um, application logging. So. You're probably all familiar with Monolog. Um, probably use it as, as well pretty frequently. So if you're using that, um, and if you're using that to send your logs um, from your application to a centralized place, might be Logly, might be something else, um, then actually you can just keep using that. Um, uh, and that means your, your log files are actually kept off your containers in a separate place. Um, we, we started doing this ourselves, but we actually found that there was quite a large performance overhead when you weren't just um, using the log, logging framework locally. So when we were actually sending logs to our, our logging service provider, it actually ended up taking the bulk of our request time. So we've stopped using that solution ourselves. Um, but that does give you, uh, the developer, a really high degree of control um, over the logging implementation. Um, 
A couple of other solutions. Uh, you can have a dedicated logging container running. So you end up forwarding your logs from your application containers into that logging container. And that logging container's only responsibility then is um, to centralize logs. Um, so it, that logging container can then take the performance overhead of uh, your, you know, your other applications and do something with those. So whether it's you know, stick it into CloudWatch or stick it into Logly, that container can take the hit on those. So um, the great thing about this is that logging now becomes part of your actual architecture. Um, the, the downside to this is that because you're using one dedicated logging container for all of your applications, actually, if you want more fine-grained control over it, um, means that you have to set up your logging container to, um, to be aware of you know, many different types of customized logs, which isn't great. <clears throat> so um, yeah, the other the final solution um, that you might come across is logging via sidecard. So this is pretty similar to um, what we've just talked about. Um, but each application container is paired with a dedicated logging container here. So this then gives you that flexibility. Um, but it is more difficult to set up. And um, yeah, you, you kind of really need to get your head around that one. Um, uh, OK, other processes. So um, quite often, you'll want to run more than one process in a container. And this is a problem, well, a problem which we've come across, um, whereby an application might need to run a cron or might need to run some workers. Um, so in order to do that, we use a process manager. Um, so we use supervisor D for that. Um, uh, and to get set up with this, it's actually, it's really easy, and you can keep um, you can keep your uh, repository um, really clean as well. So, uh, just to give you an example of this, actually, let me. Um, so, so here, uh, all we've done. This is a Docker file. Um, all we've done is we've installed Supervisor and Cron uh, as part of our services. We've got our base Supervisor configuration. Uh, we kind of copy that over. Um, and that supervisor configuration, uh, it'll look for any star.conf files within a certain directory. Um, so underneath the conf.d directory, if we want to add workers or if we want to add um, our cron, that's where we would put the configuration for that. Supervisor would then be in charge of starting up the PHP FPM process, be in charge of keeping that running. And if a cron is enabled, you'll be in charge of keeping that running too, and any workers. And it also gives you the flexibility to start as many different processes of those um, as you want as well. Um, container monitoring. So this is the last topic that I'll talk about. Um, but when you've got stuff running in production, to complete your picture of what's going on, now that you've got your logging sorted as well, um, uh, you want to actually have eyes on um, all of your different containers. Um, you want to know what CPU usage there is. You want to know if any of them are uh, maxing out on memory. Um, uh, you want to know network stats, a bunch of stuff that you want to know. Um, so it's the same kind of metrics that you'd be interested in. Um, but for the, the solutions for this uh, are not necessarily the standard solutions um, that you would use uh, for non-Dockerized applications. Because containers um, can be fired up uh, very individually, you can have lots of containers running on one host. Um, it's actually you know, your typical, typical ways of monitoring this um, aren't available to you. Uh, fortunately, there are a bunch of services out there which um, are easy to set up and give you these kind of metrics. Um, so we use New Relic for our container monit monitoring. Um, and once you actually get the eyes on 
uh, what your containers are doing. You can then start to tune, um, for example, the amount of memory uh, that a specific container is able to use. Um, you can actually start to tune how many services you want to scale up at any one time. Um, so that's, that's kind of why monitoring is really important there. Um, <clears throat> some common mistakes that people make. Um, so I've talked about creating images from running containers, doing your Docker commit and pushing that up to the repository. Just don't, don't do that. Um, deploying with the latest tag to production. This isn't a great idea because um, that latest tag could change at any point in time. Um, you might want to do that for your own staging environment, um, but the latest tag is the default tag as well uh, that's created, um, so you just need to be aware of that. We've talked about uh, secrets. Um, I've got can you read images twice there. Um, but doing too much in your run SH as well. So like the composer install. Whilst that's OK in development, you want um, the startup of your image when you run it to a container, you want that to be um, as fast as possible. And if you're doing things like composer installs in uh, your entry point scripts, then that's actually going to take maybe five minutes to go and get all the dependencies. Um, those dependencies might not be available uh, at the time you're running the container as well. Um, and it'll just mean your deployments take, take forever to get out. Um, and relying on IP addresses in your configuration, that's never a good idea with HA. Um, so uh, just to finish off, the deployment uh, process now um, becomes very, very simple. You've got your immutable image in your Docker registry. Um, that's been tested on staging. Everything's great there. Um, and whatever orchestration tool you're using for production purposes, uh, you would go and update that bit of orchestration to use the new image that you've now tagged. Um, and it just becomes a question of switching uh, the image from, let's say, 100 to 110, um, deploying that, um, and, and that's, that's it. If you want to roll back, you know you can do so with confidence. Um, to your previous image, which is going to give you the exact same behavior as it did before. Um, and you can then start um, to ensure that your deployment, deployments are all zero downtime, that you've got load balancers sticking in front of them, which are draining connections from your old container, switching them over to the new container, and then getting rid of your, your, old, your old container. Um, so hopefully now, uh, you should all be in a position. You should all be in a position um, to create immutable and ephemerable Docker images yourselves. And I'd just like to end uh, with saying that it doesn't have to be the sysadmins or the DevOps to do this. This is actually quite a simple process. Um, and for us, this was completely driven by the development teams, um, and something which which you should all do to start. Um, receiving some of the benefits of it. Thank you. <laughs> I think it, uh, it, it is lunchtime, so everybody, everybody's probably starving. So if you've got any questions, um, I'll hang around up here um, for about five minutes, and then I will go and get some lunch myself. Thanks.